The fundamentals of discrete math is propositional and predicate logic. Mathematics are all about statements or propositions that are true or false. When we combine these expressions together to form compound expressions, they have various combinations of truth values. Suppose P and Q take on the various possibilities of truth values. The negation of P is true precisely when P is false. The conjunction P and Q is true precisely when both P and Q are true. The disjunction is true precisely when at least one of P and Q is true. And the implication is true when given that P is true, Q must be true. If P is false, we would say that P implies Q is true vacuously. The biconditional is true precisely when P and Q have the same truth values. A tautology is always true, and a contradiction is always false. In particular, these tautologies form the basis of various crucial proof techniques. Each proof technique assumes several premises, from which we can derive a definitely true conclusion. The proof technique modus ponens assumes that P is true, and the implication P implies Q is true. If these two premises are satisfied, the conclusion must be that Q is true. For a proof by cases, we need the following premises. At least one of P or Q must hold, P must imply R, and Q must imply R. If these three premises hold, we can necessarily conclude that R must be true. For the proof by contradiction, if we can show that P being false leads to a contradiction, we can automatically conclude that P must be true. Another useful technique is known as mathematical induction. Suppose we know that the proposition holds when n equals to 0, and suppose we know that whenever a proposition holds for k, it holds for the following number k plus 1. Combining these two premises, we can conclude that Pn must hold for any non-negative integer n. Combining the basic notions in logic and proofs allows us to describe sets. We say that x is an element of A to mean that the object x belongs to the set A. We say that A is a subset of B precisely when any element of A must belong to B. We say that the two sets A and B are equal to each other when they are both subsets of each other, and the empty set is defined as the set where there are no elements. With these notions of sets, we can define the union of two sets, which basically contains any element that belongs in at least one of A or B. The intersection consists of elements that belong in both A and in B. The set difference contains elements in A that do not belong to B. And the Cartesian product consists of pairs of elements where objects in the first coordinate belong to A and objects in the second coordinate belong to B. Finally, the power set of A consists of all subsets of A. We can use sets to define relations, with which we can prove using logic and proof techniques as well. A relation is simply a subset of the Cartesian product. In other words, it consists of ordered pairs where the first coordinate belongs to A and the second coordinate belongs to B. We say that R is a relation on A if R is a subset of A cross A. And given two relations R and S, we can define their composite relation, which essentially allows us to find links from items in A to items in C, as well as the inverse relation, which basically flips the relations from B to A instead of from A to B. Let tilde be a relation on A, and we will denote A tilde B to mean that the ordered pair AB belongs to the relation tilde. Suppose we know that tilde is reflexive. That is, for any element A in the set A, A tilde A. Suppose tilde is symmetric as well, which means that whenever we have A tilde B, we also have B tilde A. And finally, suppose that tilde is transitive. This means if A tilde B and B tilde C, we obtain necessarily that A tilde C. If tilde satisfies all these three criterion, we call tilde an equivalence relation, which generalizes equality. We can collect all of the elements that are related to the element A, and we can make the following observations. For any element in A, the 
equivalence class containing A is non-empty, non-equal equivalence classes must be disjoint, and taking the union across all of these equivalence classes will give us all of A. The collection of these equivalence classes forms what we call a partition of A. Suppose now we have a different relation, and we will denote A less than or equals to B, whenever the ordered pair AB belongs to less than or equals. Suppose this relation is reflexive. Suppose this relation is anti-symmetric. That means if you have two elements that are related to each other, these two elements turn out to be one and the same. And suppose the relation is transitive. We call less than equals a partial order on the set A. This is a generalization of the less than or equals to in our usual understanding of real numbers, which gives us the well-ordering principle. Let S be a subset of the non-negative integers. Then if S is non-empty, it must have a minimum element. It turns out that the well-ordering principle is logically equivalent to the principle of mathematical induction. And once again, it turns out that relations are used to define functions. Let f be a relation from A to B, and suppose each input has at least one output, and each input has at most one output. Denoting b equals to f of a, we call f a function from A to B. It has domain A, codomain B, and range obtained by collecting all of the different possible outputs. In general, this range is simply a subset of B. The function f may have some of these properties. We say that f is subjective if each output B has at least one input A. We say that f is injective if each output B has at most one input A. And we say that f is bijective when it is both surjective and injective. Furthermore, we can combine functions together. If f is a function and g is a function, then we can define the composite function g circle f. We take all the outputs of f and plug it into the function g. Furthermore, it turns out that f is bijective precisely when the inverse relation f turns out to also be a function. We can consider two sets a and b with m and n elements respectively. Turns out that there is a bijection from A to B precisely when M equals to N, there is an injection from A to B precisely when M is not more than N, and there is a subjection from A to B precisely when M is not less than N. These ideas hold for finite sets and can be somewhat generalized to infinite sets. We say that A and B have the same cardinality precisely when we can find a bijection from A to B. We say that A is finite if A has the same cardinality as some finite set. But interestingly enough, we say that A is countably infinite if it has the same cardinality as the natural numbers. We say that A is countable precisely when A is either finite or countably infinite. We say that A is infinite precisely when it is not finite, and uncountable precisely when it is not countable. Countable sets have really really nice properties. Suppose we have a countable set A, and suppose we have a countable set B. Turns out that the union of two countable sets must be countable. Furthermore, when we take the product of two sets, this product is also countable. If B is a subset of A, then B being not larger than A, in a sense, is also countable. And we can generalize this idea. If we can find an injection from B to A, then we also obtain that B is countable. These are really useful countability properties for problem solving purposes. Several countable sets include the natural numbers, the product of natural numbers, the integers, the rationals, and the set of all computable functions. Countable sets include the power set of the natural numbers, the real numbers between 0 and 1, by extension you obtain the real numbers, as well as the set of functions in general. This allows us to derive that there is at least one uncomputable function. While we can talk about countably infinite sets, it might be useful to derive several counting principles for finite sets. The number of elements in a union is the sum of the number of elements whenever these two sets are disjoint. The number of elements in the product is the product of the number of elements, and likewise for set differences as well. The factorial of n defined by descending multiplication is a really useful notion in combinatorics. 
which helps us define the n choose r quantity, which intuitively tells us how many subsets of size r we can obtain from a set of size n. These counting techniques equip us with many useful combinatorial identities. These pure ideas in discrete math can be applied in two ways. Firstly, from a number theoretic point of view, we can use this to define divisibility and congruence in terms of divisibility. Turns out that congruence modulo n forms an equivalence relation on the integers. This helps us derive the Euclidean algorithm, which basically tells us that we can always find integers q and r, such that b can be written in terms of a, q and r. We can also define Fermat's little theorem, which tells us that a to the p minus 1 is equivalent to 1 modulo p. Finally, this can be applied in cryptographic ideas, which I believe is used in RSA encryption. We can also apply these ideas from a graph theoretic point of view. Suppose V and E are sets, and we call each element in E an edge. Roughly speaking, it connects vertices in the set V. G is a graph if it is made up of a pair, the vertices and the edges. And we say that this graph is acyclic if it does not contain any cycle. It is connected if between any two points you can find a path between them, and it is a tree whenever it is connected and acyclic. It turns out that G being a tree is a really really useful property in computer science. And we can check that G is a tree precisely when it is connected and the number of its edges equals the number of its vertices minus 1. These are the fundamental ideas and applications of discrete mathematics in a nutshell.